and I want to elaborate that with an example. So there are these two logos, I'm sure everybody is in India is famous, uh, you know, this, this logo, Manupi Suzuki is something which is pretty famous, and uh, then on the right side is Audi. So let's assume that <coughs> both of them are your clients and you have to build an application for both of them. The app is functionally kind of same. In both of the cases, the app talks to some of the uh, gadgets you know, um, inside your car, like for example, maybe the audio. Maybe they want to have some sort of keyless entry or some sort of communication to the, to the car, right? So those sort of things, basic operations that you want to do. But functionally, they are same. But how do you approach when you're talking to uh, Maruti in terms of what is important for them and how would you approach if it's Audi? Right? For that, you would have to understand their user base first. Both, mind you, both the companies are doing exceptionally well in their own domain. Maruti is doing really well in terms of catering to the masses. They give you products which get the job done. Whereas, Audi, again, makes amazing cars, so they are targeting a very different segment. They are targeting the luxury segment. There is the expectations from somebody who is buying an Audi would be very different than from somebody who is buying a Maruti. So, for example, if I am going to build this app for Maruti, what I would do is that the first thing I want to make sure is that functionally, it's up to the mark. And in terms of experience, at least the basic experience is good enough for the user to be able to work with it. Whereas, in case of Audi, if he's paying 40 lakhs plus for a car, and you give him an app, in which even though it's a native app, the experience is not close to the kind of native experience that he is used to, he would say, you know what, this is really not the kind of stuff that I had paid money for. So the expectations are different, which is why whenever you are building an application, it's, it's also important to first consider, okay, what is my user base? What are their expectations? What would their reaction be if they look at look at uh, something with really high experience or something which is really functional? Um, a Maruti user, for example, I have a Maruti. If, if they give me an app which works, I won't complain in terms of, uh, yeah, the, the usability should be good, but it should not be as top-notch as somebody who is owning an Audi probably would expect. Right? So that's, that's, that's like two extremes. You might lie somewhere in the middle in which things get complicated. So you, you might want to figure out really how do you want to uh, profile your customer base and understand them even better. The next uh, important info that you would want to look at is the reach. So the, the app that you want to release or the product that you want to release will be going out to uh, your customers, right? In terms of what is the maximum reach that you will get? What kind of platforms are they using? So for example, if you're targeting something in, in the US or maybe I think in Europe or Australia, <coughs> iOS is an important platform there. So you would want to ensure that you are giving something in that platform when you are launching. You cannot ignore that platform when you are when you are going out. Uh, you know when you are starting it with your application. Whereas if you are targeting maybe in India, if you are targeting Android, probably you are covering 70 to 80 percent user base. Uh, the smart user base maybe. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but pretty much most of the users are on Android. And the other option is we still have pretty good modern browsers. In fact, some of the browsers on the latest smartphones are capable of doing stuff which uh, the desktop browsers are able to do today. So all the latest HTML5 capabilities are coming on this browser. So if it is important for you to ensure that, okay, you get at least something working to start with, the maximum number of user base, probably this is an option, right? You, you target the web. But in certain cases, it might make sense, and we're going to talk in detail about when it would make sense, probably to just target one platform versus targeting all of them. The third thing uh, that I want to talk about is, what is your app really? Is it is it really a product in itself, or is mobile or the app another channel for your core business? Now, to, to understand this, let's look at a couple of examples. Let's take Instagram for an, uh, as an example. The Instagram, uh, Instagram app is at the center of whatever that organization is doing. That is their product. So the team at Instagram is building an app, and that is their main source of revenue or main source of user base. That's why this strategy should be X, and we'll talk about what their strategy can be, in terms of how they want to cater to the needs of the customer. Right? So that's one example when the app in itself is a product. So a lot of games also come into this space where they are releasing something on mobile phones. So this game, like maybe Angry Birds or something, is a product for that particular uh, user base. On the other extreme, let's look at an airline. Let's take Indigo for an example. Indigo's main business obviously is flying planes. 
they want to be able to take users from place A to place B. But mobile or, or the app is, a, is an important channel for the users to connect to the airline. So they might have a different strategy in terms of how they want to cater to it. For them, they cannot say probably that I'll just cater to iOS to start with and not to, not to uh, Android. Whereas in case of Instagram, it's a product, right? Nobody has an experience with that. So, so their focus is to have the best experience. So they might just simply say, you know what? I'll put the best engineers for iPhone and I'll start with that. If that succeeds, then I'll replicate it on other platforms. So that's exactly what Instagram did. They came out with iPhone first in the US and they captured the market. Once they saw that there is money in this, there is user base, then they replicated that in other platforms. Then it worked great for them. Whereas for Indigo, if they, if they want to release an app, they will not say that, okay, it's, it, people are going to define Indigo by the app that they release. That's not going to be the case. An app should be able to connect to their core business, whether it's booking flights, checking flight status. That functionality is really above and beyond the experience or the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, selected user base that you want to target. Again, as I said even previously, the situation is not always as black and white. You might be in a situation where you are lying somewhere in between. So take some of these examples. There, there can be many more. Uh, so Amazon, for example, if they already had a website and their core business, is it a website or is it shipping products in time? Is it the logistics? So it's a bunch of both, right? For them, the website or the mobile app is also important, but they also have uh, have other important aspects by which people judge them in terms of the time of delivery and all of that. So there is always some gray areas, but it's always important to understand which side does your use case lie in the case of your application. So that will help define what kind of uh, what kind of strategy you can set up uh, for a successful application. Uh, now, you want to come up with a strategy, but you want to come up with a strategy and you want to have the long-term goal in mind. Now, let, let's take an example of Instagram, for example. Instagram releases something. They did not do that well right, in that one platform. They will probably go ahead and start building something else. They'll try something else out. But Supposedly that they release an app, or maybe Indigo releases an app, it doesn't matter which organization at this point, but whoever releases an app and the customers like it, they are going to keep demanding more and more. The expectation is going to be that the experience is going to keep matching the upgrades that are coming in the OS, the kind of new features that are there on the phones. So the expectations from the user keep rising. So even though they were okay with Indigo having a very basic app to start with, or Instagram having very basic features, but the user experience was nice to start with, but eventually, they are going to want more or uh, some of the big guys right? like Google or Facebook or somebody else will either buy them or they'll have a better product out there before even they come to know. Right? So even though they can start with a little bit of less of a user experience, so if, you're, if, you, if your line of deployment is here, so you have not deployed anything and these are the three platforms let's say that you want to target, what happens in the middle is something we'll talk about. But what is your ultimate aim going to be? If you are going to remain in the business of building these apps, and these apps are adding business value, eventually you would want to give the best to your customers. It can take months or even years to get there. I mean, today, in today's time, years is like way too long, but at least months for you to get there. It cannot happen that tomorrow you launch it and you have awesome apps out there. It might take a little bit of time, but your ultimate goal still, if you want to remain in this business, is so that you get the best user experience on all the platforms uh, for all of your customers. Whether it's iPhone, whether it's Android, whether it's web, you want to give them the best, uh, best uh, of what you can offer. Now, we understand that there are, there are these input, three input parameters that I talked about. There are many more, obviously, but these are the three that I'm highlighting. Uh, and we understand what the ultimate goal should be if you have to remain in the business of building apps. Uh, and, and that the app itself is adding value to the core business. But then let's look at what are the strategies that you can use. The first is what, what we call the laser strategy. This is something that Instagram did. Uh, so it makes sense that if your app is kind of a product app like Instagram, where the user's first impression makes a lot of difference in terms of the even existence of your company. You might not exist if the first experience of the user is bad and they won't download it again if, if they are not happy with it and they won't come back. So in that sort of a situation where you would say that the experience or, or, or it's more of a product kind of a app that you're building, you want to ensure that you get the best engineers for the platform that you want to build. 
and you target the best user experience on that one platform. If you pick all the three and try to ensure that you get there, as I said, it can take months because you don't even have enough data. If you're trying to uh, do everything in one shot, maybe maybe you lose a lot of money or you won't get the kind of feedback that you're looking for. But in terms of targeting one platform and ensuring that you're concentrating on that one platform and building the best that you can, it reduces a lot of other overheads that you have to take care of and that one platform can be like the leader in terms of defining what the others should look like and how you need to follow. So you would release something in one platform and then you would replicate it in the other and the third. I mean, it depends on the number of, uh, number of platforms that you have. And obviously, the amount of money or the amount of returns you're getting from the first one will define how quickly you want to do the rest. But once you have the money, then it, then it is not a problem to add people and teams, right? It's about where you want to start with and how do you approach the strategy. So this is the first strategy, which as, as I said, is more of a product app kind of strategy, but not saying that channel apps can't go to this. It depends on their, again, use case. There are a lot of factors you need to consider. The other is what we call a cover your basic strategy. Now, what, what is this about? Again, more of a, the other end, the, the channel app, as I said, the Indigo example. For them, the reach is important. But maybe the user experience is not, the, not something that the users will define them. That, okay, the user experience was bad, I'm not going to fly. The user experience of the Indigo app on iPhone was bad, I'm not going to fly Indigo again. No, as long as the flights are out of time and they are cheap, they, people are still going to go with Indigo, not because they have a bad app. So, in that sort of situation, breadth is important because you don't want them to say, hey, my Android customers are more happy than my iPhone customers. So, it's probably not a great uh, uh, expectation that you'll set for the users. So here is where more of the cross-platform tools like HomeGap or some of the others that maybe you've heard about, right? and all from the picture, where all that you're saying is, for me, getting the functionality out on all the platforms is important. I might not be able to cater to the specific needs of each platform in terms of usability, but I'll get there. My ultimate goal is still the same. I want to be able to have the best apps, but to for me to get started, for me to not lose on my, on my customer base in terms of what the competition is doing, at least let me get started and start building something. Remember, the ultimate goal is always to get here, but how do you get there is, is, is the key, right? And, and over months, again months if not years, at least you should be here. Now, whether it means starting with phone gap and eventually discarding it on one platform and then changing it to native makes sense. Maybe you, that's what you want to do. Maybe you want to try another uh, cross platform as you go along, but it all depends on the kind of success that you had in the initial phase and the kind of returns that you're seeing from them so that you can invest more money over time. A lot of people make this mistake of saying, I want the best to start with. So they start investing heavily in three different platforms with three different teams, and none of them get it right, and they lose a lot of money. So these were the two key strategies in terms of uh, how, you can, how you can try to get to the ultimate goal. Now let's look at another important part of the strategy which usually people uh, have been asking, and this has been this has been probably going on for the last three to four years when mobile has really picked up. Should we go native first? Should we go web first? And and what what we should do? I'm hoping some of the slides before this was was able to answer some of that question. But essentially now that you are at the decision point, these are two extremes. Yeah. It's, it's again very contextual. If you want to be able to get the reach as quickly as possible in terms of basic functionality. So let's take the airline example. For them, let's say their competitor already has an app out there from which they are getting 10% of the bookings, which is huge, right, on mobile. So they are not able to tap into that market. Maybe there are some people who are really on the move and want to be able to book flights as they go. Like whether they are driving, if they are too busy or whatever the use case may be. For them, they have two ways to go about this. They are saying that, okay, I want to ensure that I reach all my user base. But what is the strategy going to be? Am I going to have three different teams who are targeting these three different platforms? right? Or at least let me start by something with a, with a cross-platform approach in which maybe it's just a mobile website that they build to start with. Because at least there is an option. If Indigo is pretty good at everything else that they do, at least the user will go to the website and at least be able to book. There is something that they are giving to the user before committing on making the big leap. Now, I'm not saying 
Now on the side, they are shouldn't evaluate whether they should keep doing it for this platform. These are all decisions which have to be made by looking at the analytics, how many people are really booking online, uh, on mobile. And then looking at the kind of money that they are making in terms of how the mobile, how much money am I making that I can invest in it. There is no one answer is essentially what I'm saying that, okay, you know what, native and you're, you're good. Okay, cross platform and it's good. A lot of cross platform frame, frameworks try to say that you use us and everybody's going to be happy. That has never been the case. Because no matter what they do, in the end, whatever interface they are providing is the least common of all the three platforms. So for example, like iPhone came up with ID or Passbook. For Android to be able to handle that will take time. So the cross platform apps that were there initially on day one were not supporting that feature. But if you had native app, you would, you would have been able to support something like that from day one. So there are pros and cons of each approach. But cross platform gives you the breadth and the speed to iterate, which native apps cannot. Right? So, so there is always a trade off. And I'm going to talk about that trade off on this slide as well. So when uh, on, the, on the extremes, if you take building native apps, you have a lot of money, you want to be able to build native apps on all the three platforms. If that's one approach, and on the other extreme, it's the web, where you just have one code base, and browsers on all the new, uh, all the latest phones are able to run this this application. Mind you, you're using HTML5, you can make make some amazing apps, which can probably give some of the native apps around for the money in terms of the performance. But that's another uh, another topic. Uh, but what are the key trade-offs that we are talking about, right? Obviously. The affordability is more in terms of web, right? You have one team, one platform, and the browser takes care of the rest of, of how to show it on a specific platform. And on the other end, it's about user experience. The kind of experience that an iPhone user would expect when he's working on an iPhone is something like his mail app or his calendars, right? He wants that kind of experience because he's used to that. A web would be would work in some cases, but it will still be a little bit of compromise in terms of how, how his expectations would be. So if these are the two key trade-offs, you will you will need to decide, do you have enough money to be able to do this in the short or the long term? Or this is a viable thing to go ahead with if user experience is not as important, as I said, in case of channel apps probably. But there are, as I said, there are a bunch of things that have come in between. Uh, so there are these, these tools that are there that help uh, in, in some cases. Some are more towards native, they allow you to do a native UI. Examining is a .NET cross-platform framework in which you actually write code using .NET and you write the UI native, so they don't uh, write the UI at all. Phone gap, uh, out of the box, the way it works is you are essentially building a mobile website and you have the JavaScript interfaces to get into the accelerometer or the geolocation or those kind of native APIs. So, this is kind of the end of the first section of my slide in which I talk about implementation strategy and uh, how you should go about choosing and deciding what are the factors that will influence that strategy. Any any questions at this point before I proceed? Okay. So the next uh, slide is about keeping the client side light. In this section what we are going to look at is while you are building these multiple applications or supporting these multiple platforms, care has to be taken to ensure that they are not getting so complex that maintaining them or some of the basic things that, that you would have done differently when you were building a website are not done in this case. So some, tip, uh, some, some pitfalls that we've seen teams fall into. What I'm going to start with is understanding what client-side logic really means. When I say client-side logic, I give a very basic example of Simple example where things can things might seem pretty straightforward, but eventually you can fall into this trap if you don't take care. So let's say that you have a requirement. Uh, the product owner tells the iOS team or uh, that you know what once the user logs in, I want to be able to see a welcome message saying that welcome user, whatever the user's name is, full name of the user. It's a very simple requirement, right? In terms of what needs to be done on the app. So as an iOS developer, what you do is, okay, you figure out, okay, after login, how do I get this name? So you talk to the API team. So you have an API team or, or some backend folks will, which will tell you, okay, you know what, don't worry, we have a profile API. So just make that call. Uh, as a matter of fact, you might already be making that call to show some of this information. In that, just look at this one node. And in that node, you'll get the name. You'll have both the first name and the last name, please. You're like, wow, this is exactly what I need. 
so what do you do? You go ahead and on the client side you say I am getting a phone name, let me do this. Let me say first name, this is copy script syntax or maybe Ruby like but let's assume that in iOS he is writing this. So all that he is doing is he is right, concatenating the first name and last time he is getting the phone name, it's simple right and, and he is able to show the welcome message as straightforward as that, not complex at all. But then the Android developer comes along, obviously the product owner doesn't want to leave Android behind. So he, uh, uh, after a few days he tells the Android developer, hey by the way you also need to do this, so simple changes, go ahead and ask the iOS, they have iOS, they tell them okay this is the API I'm using, this is the one concatenating, uh, let's uh, do that change even in Android. So in, so after a few days, the change is out in both iOS and Android. You are seeing the results and everything, everything looks great. It's a very simple requirement and your customers are happy. Then there is a change in requirement. Change in requirement actually happened somewhere else, not in your app. Let's say that the place where they are capturing the name, they started also capturing the middle name now. Because a lot of users complained that, you know what, I have to put my first name in, uh, 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 I mean, I, to, I can't put my full name because you're not asking for the middle name. Or whatever, right? I mean, this is just an example. There could be more complicated scenarios in these things. So, what the backend team starts doing is they started capturing using whatever mechanism, even the middle name, and the and the response now looks like this: that it has the first name, the middle name, and the last name. So, obviously, they started capturing this, but what is the client still showing? It's still showing first name, last name. In this case, it will be Amitabh Bachchan, not Harivansh Bachchan, right? So kind of broken, right, and in terms of the user entered something but he is not seeing that. Maybe in this particular case he is okay but there might be other cases in which this can break actual functionality. So what you do, obviously as a as an iOS and Android developer, those they get this change in requirement or they get this defect logged into the system, they go ahead and make this change and uh, the change is simple again, the change is not complicated, they just add the middle in there and release it. Now the new release has to be pushed, right. You have another 2 dot, if 2 dot 1 dot out, this is 2 dot 1 dot 1 or 2 dot 2, whatever you want to call it. But this is a new release that's going out. People will have to download it. Hopefully a lot of people have automatic download set up, so most of them have it. But a lot of users will still see the old data. Fine, at least anybody who has to go is fine. But I hope you guys are getting the point, right? Where I'm getting at in terms of this was a small thing that could have been fixed and we will see what that means by, by fixing this kind of an issue. So if you have to keep the client light in this particular case, we don't want to add complexity on the client side. What is the solution going to look like? The solution should be pretty straightforward. The back end should be responsible of defining what the full name should look like. And the API should give me back the full name. As long as the API is giving me exactly what I need, I don't need to add any business logic on the client side and my code will look very simple. Things can't probably go wrong here now. If I had done this early on, then probably the middle name thing would have been released without even going to the app store. It's just a backend fix that has to happen. So I hope the benefits of what I'm talking about when I'm saying that your plans need to be light are clear, but let's let's highlight them again. The first and the obvious benefit is that the duplication of code is reduced. So Android and iPhone don't both decide how the full name should be computed from the name mode and the response. The API does that. And basic principles of any programming that we do, whether it's object oriented or functional, you don't want duplication of code. So just extend that even to this when you're building and supporting multiple apps. You should have less duplication of code and by make, making these simple changes in the API you should, get, you should be able to get it. The other effect, uh, uh, benefit is, as I said, it's easy to fix defects. You are not really required to release new app to fix defects. This again was a simple, small, very simple example, but consider cases in banking applications or in, in airline applications where you, you would need calculations in the client side to be able to get the total or something like the tax amount, whatever it is. Things can go really wrong if you don't take the right decision as far as the API is concerned. And and a neat side effect is some changes can actually be released without the app uh, release being required. So fixes is one thing, but in some case, if the if the fact that the middle name is a new requirement, catering to that when you are showing the welcome message, if that's a new requirement, then that is actually released without releasing the app. So your app is not updated as frequently. It's easier for you. It's easier for your customers because they they don't have to go through the pain of downloading it again or using extra bandwidth. So these are the clear benefits. At this point, I'm 
I'm hoping that everybody understands when I talk about reducing the logic on the client side, what kind of logic am, am, am I talking about? Not the logic to how to uh, get the location or the other other APIs which definitely have to be on the client side or the visual aspects, the UX and all of that. That have to be on the client side and those are complex. But we don't need to unnecessarily complicate our applications. So keeping this in mind, let's see how do we make this happen. What are the what are some of the API best practices that can be followed to ensure that this does not happen? There are a host of uh, documents out there about good API practices, whether you call REST API, and then in terms of there's HAL, uh, the micromedia as, as the way to communicate with me uh, or, or send the links of subsequent calls. But I'm not going to go into those specific details because those are very well documented and available. But at a high level, at least what we should ensure to uh, what we should do to ensure that our clients uh, are not looted unnecessarily. Now one is you should always have a consistent interface for the apps. By consistent interface, what I mean is they should have a consistent format for example. You should not have an API working with JSON and another API for your same organization working with XML. That's a clear no-no. Why should your app be taking the burden of dealing with two different formats, whereas that format translation can easily be done on the server side. A very simple thing, but we've seen repeatedly. We believe it or not, there was an example in which the customer is sending back JSON, and inside that, in one node, there was an XML string which you had to take out. So those kind of things is also something we've seen. Uh, they should be uh, backend system or, or database agnostic. So whether you're using MySQL, Oracle, MySQL, or whether it's the is the booking system or it's the shopping system, whatever it is, those intricate details about what kind of data and how do they store it should not be exposed by the API. The API should be very clean. I'm asking for this information. Give me a clear, simple JSON which gives me exactly the fields that I'm interested in, and that's it. Not extra noise, maybe something that comes out of some database or something that is really not required. And the third is, is this covers a, covers a breadth of things, and we're not going to go into details, but it does follow a standard architecture. I hope nobody's using SOAP anymore, but if you're using REST, use that for all the APIs. There are very good REST client APIs uh, available, or client libraries available. So they will do the hard work, you will just have to look at the data. And unnecessarily do not complicate your apps by using different architectures in terms of the APIs. So that's what I mean by consistent interface uh, and how that is going to help keep your apps uh, light and maintainable. Next, again some, something very obvious, something that a lot of people have missed, is aggregate the response. Do not let the app make multiple calls when it does not need to. So for example, let's say that you have a banking app and in the banking app, you have an account section in which you show account details. So you say, say show the type of account, blah, 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 and then you also show the balance that the account has. So the, the user taps on get account details and gets these. Today, you have two separate backend systems which manage this. Because balance is pretty in real time, the backend team had actually done a very good design, made, made a good design decision to keep that as a separate API, because this is nearly real time. They want to keep this separate and maintain it separately. So they kept that separate, but the but the main bank details is pretty much static once you open the bank account, maybe the address changes or something, but otherwise this, this stuff remains pretty static. So the backend engineers did a great job of keeping these concerns separate so that they can maintain these servers or whatever they have to do separately. But what your app is now doing is they is having to make these two calls. They, do, they can be done uh, asynchronously. Uh, in parallel, but still there is two network calls that are made. Why is the number of things that can go wrong on the client side? So just provide another API, which is an aggregate API on top of these two, which gets, that's the hard work of getting the data, aggregating data from different backends, and at least giving it in one shot to the client. So the client is still making just one call, and it is getting the data that it needs to display. It's not have to unnecessarily make multiple calls. In some cases, if it is really very separate concerns, then it makes sense, and it's just the fact of the UI that they are showing it together. But in such examples, you can easily aggregate this kind of data for your apps. Uh, because the, the infrastructure concern that they had is separate than what the app really needs at this point. The other thing is optimize your response. Uh, the, the networks are really getting faster. We have 2G, 3G, and 4G. 
But even in the US for the airline that we were building, when you are at the airport and the airport is crowded, they don't even get 2G speeds. Forget about 3G or 4G. It's so bad when it's when you have thousands and thousands of people at the airport or maybe in a stadium when they are accessing it. I'm sure you guys must have experienced that during uh, during traffic hours or whatever. Right? The the speed is just not good enough. So always try to ensure that you have the optimal response. In fact, why should the user be given anything that it does not need in terms of the client? Why should it get something that it does not need at that point in time? So again, an example of the banking app in which the backend is sending you a bunch of information because this is all that the backend has, so it's exposing that information, which is fair. It's up to the client to consume whatever it wants to. So it's sending us stuff like type, branch ID, and customer ID. But on that page, you have nothing related to branch details that you're showing on that category about account information. Let's take an example. We're not showing the branch details there. We're showing the, the balance or some of the other stuff. So in that case, cut that off. Cut that, uh, filter that out, and just send to the clients what needs to be sent. Again, this is a very simple example, but you could extrapolate this to a lot of cases in which a lot of junk goes to the client, which should not essentially be going to the so that's about optimizing the response to help uh, reduce the size and speed up the response uh, response time. And then there is a there is a very interesting and, and I hope a lot of you have heard about this. It's the expand and then contract practice that that uh, we follow in some of our APIs. So the idea is that you are to change your API in such a way that you do not break existing clients, but you provide additional functionality for newer features or for the newer clients that you're pushing out. So what does it mean? Let's go back to the same example. Let's just take an example in which we had the first name and the last name coming back. So the apps were using this, concatenating it and showing the welcome message. But later on you went to the API side and you tell them, hey guys, you should be sending me the first name, uh, full name, otherwise we'll uh, get into trouble. So they were nice uh, developers, they understood your pain. And they said, okay, I'll send you the full name in a separate field. So at this point, what is happening is your existing app, which is in production, is using the first and last name. And the new app that you're going to release is using the full name. So you're using both of these. In fact, all three of these nodes in the response. And things should be still fine. The old apps will still work, at least the way they were intended to work. And the new apps will work with the new logic. But there will be a time where your user base for the old apps will go down. It, it might go down to 1%. Some some threshold after which you really don't want to maintain that because that's an overhead for you. At that time, just cut those extra fields off. Again, going back to the point of optimizing the response. So this is about expanding the contract and then eventually contracting it so that you have the you are able to support, you are able to have backward compatibility and over time you are able to optimize the response. So these are some of the best, uh, best practices in terms of what, what you can do. But going to my next section is about who owns the API. So a lot of places what happens is, hey, you know what, uh, this, these advisors are great, but really what happens in our enterprise is that there is an API team and they have their own timeline, they have their own, their own release cycles and we are releasing something. But there are these separate API because our packing systems are really complicated. Right? They normally try to complicate it just by some other factors, but whatever the, the case may be, they are they are separate people and we can't even touch them. You know what? Asking for an API change, what are you even talking? It's not possible. We are just building an app, they already have a website, they are expecting us to use the same response and just do whatever we have to do, right? So why they, they are not going to listen to me. How many of you have seen this pain if you work for this big organization? Probably you have. Uh, of, of people working in uh, different silos or they have their own managers or their own hierarchy and it's difficult for the teams to really connect with each other if they would have worked in the same uh, you know room or in the same location it would have really helped but that's not the case is that something that you guys can relate to does it make sense because this is an important aspect and this presentation till now was great but at this point i have hit a road what do i do i don't own the api so the question is essentially who owns the api the answer Obviously, using basic common sense is everybody who's really, is it's a combined effort of both the client as well as the both, both the consumer as well as the developer because we are the ones who are defining what we need in the response and they are the ones who are actually making these changes. And mind you, the, the skills are very different in terms of building an iPhone app or Android app 
and building an API uh, which has different concerns, right? Those are very different skills, so it's difficult to have the same engineers also do that. So then what can we do? What are the what are the suggestions that, that can be made to kind of mitigate this to some extent? The first is have a polyskill teams. Now by polyskill teams what I mean is that in, in our particular example what we've been looking at. Let's say that you have, you form a team for an app or a feature or whatever, you know, however you're forming the teams, uh, which have not just the one skill that that is required to do the app development, but they also have certain people with server-side skills. Obviously, you won't have mostly server-side skill people in that team. Essentially, it's about building the app, so you will have, say, let's say, nine developers which are uh, which are good at iPhone or Android or whatever, but maybe a couple who understand the server-side skills. And the second thing is important to empower that to make changes at any layer. So that team doesn't say, okay, this is all that we own and we're going to change here, or the organization doesn't tell them that, okay, you are only having access to this Git report, that's all where you make changes. You work as, an, uh, as, as one big organization and you ensure that whatever has to be done to serve the clients or make the best apps, we'll do that. So if you're making changes in the backend API, maybe it'll require review by the backend developers, that's fine. But at least you should be empowered to suggest and make those changes as part of this one single team who understands both front end and back end. This is ideal for small organizations, so organizations like, uh, you know, some startups, where in, the, in a startup, everybody really knows everything. So doing this sort of thing is a, in a startup, in fact, I don't even have to mention it, I'm sure startups already do this. Uh, and that's why they, some of the startups are so successful, they're able to iterate so fast and build great apps, because they, they have a team which is empowered to do whatever it takes to be done to be successful. Uh, and that's what makes the difference. Now, unfortunately, as companies grow, this gets difficult. So, so let's look at what else we can do. Right? I mean, this might be possible in some cases, as well as maybe in small organizations, but in all the cases, this probably does not work. So let's look at some other suggestions. Working with the API team. So you get a you get a change, right? You 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 were asked to show that welcome message with the first and the last name. Uh, once you got that requirement, you, should, you can at least do some basic analysis that I am having to write the same code in two places, iOS and Android. And this is probably something that the API can change. So you simply request for changes to the backend. Uh, you just tell the backend team and uh, hopefully they are able to provide you what needs to be done. But this can only be done if the communication channel with backend teams is straight. So you don't have to go through that hierarchy because if, if somebody tells me, you know what, make this, ask the API team to make this change. But I know that I have to ask my manager, he have to ask his manager, then he have to ask his peer and then go down. I'll probably go to that say, let me just concatenate the first and last name and get it done. I don't want to go through all that pain. So it's very important to know that you can also get this done where the communication channels are open. Yeah, give me the other one. Can you hear me? Uh, so this is this is possible only when the communication channels with the backend teams uh, are are actually direct, and this even. If, if you are in a situation where you can have polyskill teams, even if you are a mid-size organization, definitely go with that. So these are in the order of priority. The first one is the best solution that I could have thought of in terms of what you can do. But if you can't, then this is the next best solution. But this also works only when you have direct communication channels between the app developers, the, the mobile developers or whoever are doing the front end, and the back end folks who are building these back end systems and APIs. There has to be a direct channel to be able to make this effective. If you have to still go through that hierarchy or there is complications, they have their own release cycle and it gets difficult for them to change it, then this might also just fall apart. And usually in big enterprises that does happen that we do try to push them to make the changes, but eventually it falls back onto us because of the timelines that we have to get this out. So uh, this is the next thing uh, about mid-level mid organizations where you, this should be definitely be tried. The final suggestion, again, this is not a silver bullet, but this is something that if you cannot get the first two done, this is the final solution that will work even in an enterprise in a big, uh, sorry, in a big organization. So what is this mobile facade that I'm talking about? The mobile facade is essentially a middle layer that's seen by the apps. 
So you have your apps and you have the packet systems and then there is this layer in the middle which we call mobile facade, somebody calls it anti-corruption layer, there are different names for this middle layer but essentially there is a middle layer which the apps talk to, apps never talk to directly the back end. So what is the role of this, this middle layer going to be? Essentially this is going to have minimal logic to support the apps. Uh, by minimal logic what I meant is that some stuff which probably you cannot clearly push to the back end at this time, it's okay to make that changes in the middle layer, but definitely it's much better than make getting the apps to make those changes. So it's better than make, uh, concatenating the first name and the last name in the app side on multiple places, at least just do it in this middle layer or this proxy or facade layer rather than doing it in the apps. It's at least better than, than uh, moving the complexity to the client side. Now another important thing to note is who owns this mobile facade. Do not give this mobile facade ownership back to the, the backend or API developers. If you have to make a, make a very thin, lightweight facade here, it's easy for to get develop that skill within the application team or the, the mobile app team and ensure that they own the deployment as well as the release cycle of this facade as long as uh, uh, along with the release of the apps. That's important. If you again shift it to another team, it's going to lose its purpose. So it's important to understand that the mobile team or whichever team is building these apps is the team that's owning the mobile facade. Another important side effect of this is that things like aggregation and optimizing the response can actually come for free. That this is a layer where you filter out the response to ensure that corruption is not happening on the client side. The client sees a clean response. So this is a very important side effect of this and, and we've seen this work beautifully in case of large organizations again. This uh, is good for large organizations where the first two approaches might not work out and then and only then I'll, I'll uh, recommend going ahead with this because this adds another level of complexity, right? You, are have, you will have to maintain another layer but this layer is definitely better than pushing uh, complexity to the client side or moving logic to the client side. Uh, so that's all that I had for my presentation. Uh, <coughs> there are a couple of references. The first one is a, is a blog on Martin Fowler's website about the first section that I was talking about in that there is a comprehensive detail about uh, what I talked about. And uh, that's my Twitter handle. And feel free to email me or ask me questions. I think we have some time for questions, right? Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, which which app are you? Are you talking about client side apps like iPhone Android or are you talking about this middle layer? Uh, middle layer. Okay, so the middle layer should be just one. So the app is talking to one middle layer because it's a facade, it doesn't have a lot of logic, it's not heavyweight, it's just proxying from the back end to front end, right? It's doing basic stuff like aggregation and optimization, it's not adding any business logic. So there should be just one interface which should suffice. It's a, in, in the cases that we've looked at that one inter, one uh, application of a SART should be good enough to be able to cater to any of the internal uh, multiple packet systems that we are talking about. And the client side? The client side depends on how many clients you have. So if you just have one client, obviously, you know, then, then it's pretty straightforward. But if you have even multiple clients, all of them are being, are being given the same API to be able to get the kind of data that they want. They are always going through this facade. No, no, no. This is this is on the server side. On the server side, but it's a very thin layer, and it's something that can be maintained by even the app developers. That's the point of not putting a lot of logic in there, so that they control the rollout or the releases for this mobile facade as well. So essentially, it's on the server side. Definitely. That, that's how you shift the complexity to the server. Otherwise, the complexity goes back and things. Alright. Alright, thanks a lot. I hope this was helpful and feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Thank you.